take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. Just take your Bibles now, open to the book of Psalms tonight. I know we've been studying Hebrews, and we'll get back to that. But I want to look at Psalm 62 tonight. I was reading this the other morning, and I just felt like I wanted to share some things with you that the Lord showed me here in this psalm. So Psalm 62 tonight. And look in Psalm 62. This is a beautiful psalm. And look at verse 1. Truly my soul waiteth upon God, for him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Now, some of you might remember that uh, some time back, I did a series on the five solas of the Reformation. Uh, you remember that the word sola is a Latin word for alone, and uh, this became kind of a key word uh, in the battle cry of the Protestant reformers against the corruption of the church back in the early uh, 1600s. And uh, so really, the, everything kind of rallied around that one word alone. Uh, there are the five solas, we, we call them, because they really convey a very, very strong message. For example, there is Scripture alone. And then we also know one of them is grace alone. And then faith alone and then Christ alone, and then glory to God alone. These, again, were the five uh, solas, we call them, that were developed to stand against the uh, corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church taught that uh, the foundation for faith and practice was a combination of Scripture plus the tradition of the church or the uh, teachings of the magisterium and the pope, and the reformers said, no, uh, our authority is Scripture alone, just Scripture, Scripture alone. The Catholic Church taught that we're saved by a combination of grace and merits we accumulate through penance and good works, and the Reformers said, no, it is grace alone. The Church taught that you're saved by faith plus works, and the Reformers said, no, you're taught by faith, or you're saved, excuse me, by faith alone. And then the Catholic Church taught that you're saved by the merits of Christ and the saints and we approach God through Christ, but also through Mary and through the saints. And again, the Reformers said, no, uh, we approach God, we're saved by Christ alone. And then finally, uh, since Christ did all the saving, uh, opposed to what the Catholic Church said, where they said that in the sinner salvation, that you know, partly Christ gets the glory, but also partly the sinner, since you do some of the work. And again, the Reformers said, no, it is a glory to God alone. And those perversions of the church uh, that caused these battle cries are still around today. As we said, you know that, right? And that's why these expressions are still relevant for today. But tonight, I want to talk about what I would call perhaps the forgotten sola. And what I mean by that is long before the Reformers were emphasizing the importance of the word alone in their theology and practice, David saw the value of trusting God alone. And that's really what Psalm 62 is about. Uh, we could say it really like this. In life's most threatening times, you will be at peace with God if you put your trust in God alone. That's what David is telling us here. Uh, this is what this psalm is about. This psalm comes out of a time of trial for David. Now, some scholars think that David wrote this psalm when his son Absalom had rebelled against him and was forced David to flee and was trying to take over the throne. Other scholars think that this psalm was written when David was ruling over Judah and Hebron and the forces of Saul were still plotting to pull David off the throne and to establish the dynasty of Saul. But either way, it was a time of great trial in David's life. It was a time of great darkness. Look down at verse number 3 where it says, How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall, shall ye be as a tottering fence. Now, the King James Version here kind of translates verse 3 uh, 
as something that they, uh, as making it David's words against his enemies. That's kind of the way it reads. I think that uh, another way you can look at this, I think many ancient versions translate this as uh, David's uh, uh, words against his enemies, or, or excuse me, David's enemies' uh, words against him, I should say. And so they were actually treating David as a wall that is bowing, that is leaning, it's about to fall, it's a tottering wall, it's about to crumble, and that's the way the enemies were looking at David, and they were attacking him, they were thinking at any moment he's going to capitulate, he's going to cave in, and so yet David is at perfect peace. If you read this psalm, that's what you're going to find. In spite of all the hostility against David, in spite of all of the darkness and dark circumstances coming at him. He's not worried. He's not anxious. He is at peace. He is trusting in God. David is in danger, but despite that, his faith is strong. He's trusting in God alone. One great Old Testament scholar, Leupold, wrote this. He said, this is, there is scarcely another psalm that reveals such an absolute, undisturbed peace in which confidence in God is so completely unshaken and in which assurance is so strong that not even one single petition is voiced throughout the psalm. And that's true. If you read through the psalm, you're not going to find really one prayer here. David is resting in the Lord. He's at total peace. He has great confidence. He's not worried about his enemies. He's not worried about the difficult, dark circumstances the perils in his life, he's not worried about anything. He's at total peace. Let me ask you a question. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of peace? I don't know about you, what it's like in your life. Perhaps maybe some of you have come here tonight and you have difficult circumstances. You have uh, things going on in your life. Perhaps Satan is hammering you. He's attacking you. Uh, there's things happening in your life and you're not at peace and you would like to have the kind of peace that David shows us here in Psalm 62 where he is just at total rest in the Lord. What is the secret here? What is the secret of David's unshakable peace? And it is this word alone, the word alone. Now, this is hard to see in the English translation, but look at verse number one. Look at the very first word, uh, verse one. It is the word truly. That's the way it's translated here in English. But the Hebrew word is ak which is a word that is really almost untranslatable because it's very difficult to find an English word that captures the full meaning of this word. It's translated truly here, and that's fine. In other places, it is translated only. Sometimes it's translated surely or certainly. But I think that the best English word that we can use to translate this word is the word alone. Now, this Hebrew word ak is used six times in this psalm. Six times. Uh, we see it in verse 1. It's the word truly. And really, we can translate verse 1 like this. Upon God alone my soul waits. Look at verse 2. He, or we could say alone, the word only there is the same Hebrew word. He alone is my rock. Look down in verse number 5. My Again, my soul Wait thou only upon God. Again, the word only there is, the, we could say alone, we could say it like this, upon God only my soul waits. And again in verse number six, he alone is my rock and so on. And so this word is emphasized. In fact, in Hebrew, this word is the first word in every verse. And why is that true? It breaks the normal pattern, the normal syntactical pattern of a Hebrew sentence. And that only happens when the writer wants to really emphasize something. And so this word is at the beginning of the verse because it's there for emphasis. God alone. He trusts in God alone. This is what David wants to emphasize. And this is the most important part of this psalm. And this is the secret of David's peace. Alexander McLaren uh, he, I think he's one of the best preachers and commentators on the Psalms. He kind of captures this when he wrote this. He said, that one word alone is the record of conflict and the trophy of the psalmist's victory. And so David is emphasizing that if you want to have peace in the midst of the most dire circumstances in your life, in the most difficult times of your life, 
If you want to have that kind of peace that upholds you, a perfect peace, then you have to trust in God alone. God alone. And I think this is something that Christians in our day need to learn. Our problem is not that we do not trust in God in some sense. We start out coming into the kingdom. We have to trust in God alone for salvation. We know that. I just told you about the five solas of, of the Reformation. Really, they're foundational when it speaks about our salvation. We trust in Christ alone, not Christ in something else. We come by faith alone. We put our faith in the finished work of Christ faith alone, and we rely on God's grace alone. And so this is the way we come into the kingdom, by trusting in Christ alone. But something happens after we get saved. We don't necessarily live by trusting Christ alone or by putting faith in God alone. There's, there's something about us where we say, well, I trust in God, but I, I'm also trusting in this. Uh, we trust in God and someone or we trust in God and something, God and some plan. But the reason that David had perfect peace, the reason he had confidence, is because he had learned that he needed to trust in God and God alone. And so the question I want to ask you tonight, is that where you are spiritually? Is that where the church is spiritually? James Montgomery Boyce said that today the church in America has a what he called a crisis of faith, a crisis of faith. Uh, and he called it a lack of belief in God and a lack of belief in the power of the word of God. This is what he wrote. Listen to what he said. He said, the real reason preachers do not teach the Bible and resort to other devices such as light theology and funny stories is that they do not trust God. They do not believe that God actually works through his word to convert unbelievers and strengthen and form character in Christians. And so uh, they, he says that the, the reason that preachers are not preaching the word in confidence is because they don't have faith in God. That's the reason you hear more. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with telling a funny story. That's okay in a sermon. And by the way, I expect you to laugh whether it's funny or not. Nothing wrong with a little humor in a, in a sermon. Nothing wrong with those things. But we're not here to entertain you. We're here to give you the word of God. And we have faith that the word of God will do the work. But I think he's right when he says that we have a generation of preachers that do not trust God. They don't trust that God will use the power of his word. They don't have faith in God. But that's not just for preachers. That's also for lay people. They're not trusting in God alone. You may pretend to trust in God, but many are holding on to other things. That's like having one foot on a rock and the other foot on quicksand. Uh, you're going to be in trouble pretty soon because uh, you're not standing firmly on the word. And so David learned that if he was to trust it all, he had to trust God only. And really, if we're not trusting God only or God alone, we're really not trusting God at all, are we? So let me just give you the three stanzas here. This psalm, Psalm 62, is uh, divided really into three stanzas. Uh, the first two stanzas end with the word selah. The st first stanza in verses 1 to 4, and it ends with the word selah at the end of verse 4. And then verses 5 through 8 is the second stanza that ends with the word selah. And then the third stanza is verse 9 through 12. In Hebrew poetry, this is... Uh, uh, a Hebrew poem is made up of stanzas, and these are the three stanzas that make up this one psalm. And so what I want you to see in these stanzas are what I call three ways that David expresses his faith in God alone. Here's the first one. Number one, God alone is the source of protection. God alone is the source of protection. Look again in verse one. Truly my soul waits upon God. From him cometh my, what? Salvation. And look at the word wait there. This is another interesting word, demaya, which simply means silence, waiting in silence. And the idea of silence is submission. The, the silence is intended, in short, to, to, to mean that you're submitted. It's a, it's, a, it's a disposition of a believer that has acquiesced to the will of God, the sovereign will of God and the promises of God. 
that, so David is waiting, but he's waiting silently. He's not waiting and complaining uh, but, uh, that maybe God's help hasn't come quick enough. Uh, he's waiting in silence, which is to say he's waiting with a submissive spirit. Some of you know that uh, Carolyn and Abby, my daughter, flew to London on Saturday and uh, they had to leave from New York, JFK Airport. I, I hate flying out of that airport, by the way. Always seems to be some delay. But what I found out was that they, the, the plane pushed away from uh, the gate, and they had to wait for clearance, and they ended up waiting on the tarmac for two hours. Two hours. Now think about that. Uh, here is uh, Carolyn, and she's got my little grandson Theo next to her. And she has to keep them occupied for two hours on that plane. And they have a seven-hour flight ahead of them, mind you, you know. So you talk about waiting. Uh, and by the, but by the way, I was asking Carolyn how it went, and she said, you know, Theo was actually pretty good compared to some of the adults that were on that plane. I mean, they were complaining. They were raising a ruckus. You know, it's one thing to wait, but it's another thing to wait silently. You see... And you know what that reminds me of? Sometimes God will put us in a circumstance where all we can do is just wait. I don't know if you've ever been in a plane waiting for clearance. There's nothing else you can do. <laughs> you can't get up move around. You, you know, you can't do anything. You just have to sit there and wait until there's clearance. And, and it's really not that easy. And sometimes God will put us in a situation where there's nothing else that we can do. There's nothing humanly possible for us to do. All we can do is wait on the Lord and wait on his clearance, so to speak, wait on his salvation. But again, the question is, how do you wait? Do you wait with peaceful composure, absolutely submitted to the will of God and saying, God, I know that you know what you're doing, and so, Lord, I trust you in this situation. It's not happening as quickly as I want it to. By the way, it never does, right? It's never fast enough. But yet, Lord, I'm waiting on you. The key word is submission. I'm not angry. I'm not bitter. I'm at peace. I'm waiting. This is how David is waiting. He's waiting silently. But also notice he's waiting securely. Look at verse 2. He only is my rock, my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And I want you to notice how confident and secure David feels as he's waiting. Notice the descriptions. He says, God is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my refuge. He's using these descriptive words. And by the way, he uses these same words in other Psalms. But these words are metaphors, but they're used to communicate the unchangeable character of God. They used to speak about God's strength, God's protection. The thought of God as a rock and a fortress conveys the idea of a refuge set up way high. Some of you know that I just got back from Israel, and uh, one of the places I like to go when I'm there is in Gedi. This is the desert, really, fortress or hiding place that David used when he was running from Saul. And in order to get to En Gedi, you kind of kind of climb up into the rocks. I mean, it's, it's up high, and you can go up higher and higher to Ann Getty, and when you get up to the top, you can look down, and you know what you see? You can see all around you for miles. No one can get close to you without you seeing them. And there's a sense when you're way up high there, there's a sense of security there. There's a sense of safety, of feeling safe when you're there. I can just put myself in David's uh, sandals, so to speak. Uh, he's, he's there on the top of that high refuge, and he's looking around. Perhaps Saul is hunting after him, and he feels so secure there, and he's, he compares that to God. God is like that for us. He is our rock. He is our refuge. When we run to him, guess what? We're safe. And so we can feel secure. Now, David's enemies say he's like a wall that's about to fall down, that's about to crumble. But David is saying, no, I am standing on a rock, standing on a refuge, on a fortress, and so his enemies could not be more wrong. David is absolutely waiting securely, so much so that he says in verse 2, I shall not be greatly moved. I'm standing upon the character 
I'm tru- of God and God alone. I'm trusting in my rock. Is that your testimony? So God alone is the source of protection. But here's number two, second stanza. God alone is the source of peace. Look in verse number five. He says, Is my soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation and is my defense. I shall not be moved. Now, again, the theme of this stanza seems to be, again, David's great, growing peace and confidence. What I want you to see here is that his, his confidence and his peace, it's actually growing. It's getting stronger. Because we saw in verse number 2 where David said, I shall not be greatly moved. But in verse 6, what do we see? I shall not be what? Moved. In verse 2, he says, I'm not going to be greatly moved. But now his confidence has grown even more. And he says, I shall not be moved. So we see his growing confidence, his hope in God. And so therefore, his sense of calmness and peace is also growing as his confidence in God is growing. Uh, and so this will happen to you. And, but notice one of the reasons why I think it grows. He says in verse number 8, pour, Trust in the Lord at all times. Pour out your heart before him. That's a key expression there. I praise God that we can trust God and that we can pour out our heart to God. That's a key to David's peace, I believe. The fact that he's able just to pour out his heart, I think that's why he could wait silently. The reason he doesn't wait with complaining and and anger is because he's already poured his heart out before God. He's already prayed and he came before the Lord. He's already given it all over to God. And so therefore he can wait silently. Therefore he can wait with growing peace and reliance upon the Lord. But what I want you to see in this stanza is the two um, groups, or we could say, are two objects that David talks to. Who is he talking to? I want you to see, first of all, he talks to himself. Look at verse 5, where he says, My soul, wait thou only upon God. Now, who is David addressing when he says, my soul? He's talking to himself, right? Now, we think that people that talk to themselves today are crazy, right? Don't we? Uh, We think that people that do that, you know, there's, there's, there's something wrong here. But you know what? Uh, This happens in the Bible often in the Psalms. The psalmist is a lot of times talking to himself. He's he's reminding himself of something. We see this same thing in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 where the psalmist says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? That's a psalm about being down, and the psalmist talks to himself, and he says, Why are you cast down? Hope thou in God. And you, for you shall yet, for I shall yet praise him, because he's the help of my countenance. There's nothing wrong with talking to yourself in a spiritual way. In fact, Martin Lloyd Jones has a wonderful book on spiritual depression, and he refers to this. And this is what he says. Listen to what he wrote. He said this. He said, Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? You get that? You're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. Now, what, is, what did he mean by that? He, he, listen to what he goes on to say. He, go, he really goes on to explain that rather just going along with the thoughts that come to you in the morning time a lot of times. How many of you, when your eyes open up, you, get, you might get hit with negative thoughts? Anybody here like that? Okay, you guys don't need a sermon. I'm going home. I'll tell you what, that's me. I know that, you know, in the morning time, I am not a morning person. I know some people wake up and go, oh, what a beautiful morning. I want to slap those people. It's not me. When I wake up, the devil knows exactly that's the time to hit me. I wake up by degrees. I don't wake up fully at the first. And the first thing that happens when I wake up is I, I start having these negative thoughts. Oh, man, I've got so much to do today. I've got so, I'll never get it all done. And so I have one negative thought after another, and that's when the devil starts throwing them at me. And you know what I'm doing at that point? I'm listening to myself. And when I'm listening to myself... You know what's happening? I'm getting depressed. I'm already wiped out and depressed before I even get my foot out of bed. I'm listening to myself. I'm listening to the negative thoughts that are bombarding me. 
And Martin Lloyd-Jones' advice is don't listen to yourself, talk to yourself. And what does he mean by that? He means that you need to take yourself in hand and preach to yourself. Speak to yourself. This is why the, the psalmist says to himself, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you cast down? You put your hope in God. And so you know what he's basically saying here? You don't have to give in to those negative emotions and those negative thoughts that hammer you. You can talk to yourself. That's what the psalmist does. And this is exactly what the psalmist is doing here in Psalm 62. Look again in verse number 5 where he says, My soul, wait thou only upon God. For my expectation, or the, that word expectation is the word hope. My hope is from him. You know what he's doing? He's reminding himself to trust in God alone. You know why? Because when you get to that place where you're trusting in God alone, guess what? That doesn't mean you're going to stay there. We're constantly have to readjust. If I am tempted to trust in something else other than the Lord, I have to grab hold of myself and say, wait a minute, my soul, you wait and trust in God alone. He is your hope. And then you know what he does in Psalm 62? He piles up description after description of who God is. After he, he says to wait on God, look at verse 6. He only is my rock. He is my salvation. He is my defense. And then he bursts forth with greater confidence. I shall not be moved at all. Whereas before he said, I'll not be greatly moved. Now he says, I'm not going to be moved at all. He reminds himself of who God is. And that's exactly what we have to do. If we're going to trust in God alone, we have to remind ourselves to do it. We have to talk to ourselves. Don't listen to yourself. Talk to yourself. And remind yourself of who God is. Don't miss the pronouns. My rock. My salvation. My defense. And so on. Nine times from verses 5 to 7, we see the little pronoun my. David either... either uh, calls out God directly, or he uses this pronoun here in this verse. And so what does this tell us? That David knew God personally as his personal hope, his rock, We're his glad salvation. you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever-Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached, as you've just seen. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life, and He wants you to live out every day of it for His ever-living story.